one final limit. The graph of y equals f of x is shown. What is f of negative 1? 1. F of negative 1 is 1. How do we know it's 1 and not 2? There's a black dot. Black dot. Okay, so solid dot on 1. What is f of 2? F of 2 is 3. Again, black dot, right? So here's 2, there's where x equals 2. So the value of the function when the x value. And what is f of 3? Negative 2. Okay, so the function, where is it not continuous or discontinuous, or where would you have to lift your pen? Negative 1. So when x is negative 1, and when x equals 2. So I was thinking, back in the old days in computers, we used to have these things called plotters. They probably still make them. And the plotters would have little pins, and this little arm goes, would pick up a colored pen, like a black pen, just like this. And it would move out here, and the pen could move back and forth, and the paper would scroll kind of back and forth. It would draw stuff, right? So they would use that for like blueprints and stuff like that. I mean, and they probably still do, because if you're doing a really large print, whatever. But uh, I always just think of it as, you know, sometimes the pen had to lift up off the paper, and one pen is on the paper. So here, if we're drawing this, we've got to draw down to here, lift the pen, move the paper, put the pen down, draw. To here, lift the pen, move the paper up to here, put down a little dot, move back to here, etc. Right? So that's where it's not continuous, right? We have to lift the pen. So what is the limit as x approaches negative 1 from below of f of x? So negative 1 from below are approaching this way, and the limit is 1. What is the limit as x approaches negative 1 from above? What is the limit as x approaches negative 1? Does not exist, right? So if the limit as x approaches a from below is not equal to the limit as x approaches a from above, then the limit as x approaches a does not exist. Well, they give us a pretty big blank here, so I suppose we can write out does not exist. Okay. So if the one-sided limits are different, then there is no limit at that. There are one-sided limits. They do exist, but the limit itself. Okay, so we do the same thing for x approaches negative 2. Wait, negative 2? 2. So as x approaches 2 from below, the limit is? As x approaches 2 from above, the limit is? Negative 1. And the limit as x approaches 2 is negative 1. If the limit as x approaches a from below is equal to L, which is equal to the limit as x approaches a from above, then the limit as x approaches a of f of x exists, right, and is equal to L. And there's this whole thing about, you know, we, we can get arbitrarily close to A and get arbitrarily close to L. And if we want to get closer to L, then we just get closer to A. Right? And then there's this whole epsilon delta proof of the existence of limits, which we don't get into, right? But if you continue in calculus, you'll probably be looking at that proof. So is the limit of x approaches 2 at f of x equal to f of 2. So we said the limit of this was negative 1, but we said that f of 2 was 3, so is negative 1 equal to 3? You can see it all a little quicker. Okay, so is the limit that no? So is it continuous? No. What is the limit as x approaches 3 from below? You can look at your thing. So what is it? Negative 2. What is the limit as x approaches 3 from above? Negative 2. So what is the limit as x approaches 3? Negative 2. 
is the limit as x approaches, or sorry, is the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x equal to f of 3? Yes, right? Because f of 3 is negative 2. So is it continuous? Yes. So then the definition of, so if the limit as x, if the limit as x approaches a of f of x, f of x exists, and the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals f of a, then f of x is continuous at a. Okay, so if the two one-sided limits are the same and the function actually exists at that point and is equal to the limit at that point, then it's just continuous, right? So that's definition of continuity. All right. Is that good? Yeah. Any questions? Am I going too fast or anything? Okay, so let me know if I'm going too fast. It's always like... I used to teach other lessons and stuff, then I walk down the hall to get something, and somebody be like three pages behind me. I didn't think I was going too fast. Okay, so just let me know. Just say, whoa, slow down. Uh, okay, determine each limit. So the limit as x approaches 2 from above of the root of x minus 2 plus 6. So what should we first try? What's our first uh, strategy? Just substitute it in, right? And see what happens. Okay, so we're going to say that's equal to what's the square root of 2 minus 2 plus 6. Okay. Can I just say 6? You're okay with that? Like, what? Is there on the square root of 0? What is the limit as x approaches 2 from below? So that's from above, right? Which means that we know that it's 2 or it's, just, it's slightly larger than 2. But as you approach 2 from below, what's this limit? It doesn't exist. Why? Because... Because... Why? So the domain is that x has to be greater than or equal to 2. So you can be 2, that's fine. You can be greater than 2, that's fine. You cannot be less than 2. And when we say approaches 2, even though we're as close as we get, you one point nine 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 nine, you're still going to have a negative under the radical sign. You can't do that. Ah, oh, what? No. Why no volume? <laughs> it's gonna be now. Yeah. Open up the computer. I you know. Fire up the web browser. You know. Make sure that that's sitting down. There. I don't know why there's no. That's just sort of. Whatever. Okay. The limit as x approaches three from where are we coming from? From below of the absolute value of x minus three over x minus three. So what's our first strategy? Substitute in 3. What does that give us if we substitute in 3? 0 over 0. Okay, so what do we know if it's 0 over 0? So we know there's a limit then, right? So now how are we going to find that limit? All right, so we got to think about this. How is the absolute fun, uh, absolute value function defined? So if we're okay, first of all, if we're approaching three from below, then what is x minus three going to be? In the sense of will it be positive or negative? It'll be a negative, right? So then we're going to write this function as the limit as x approaches three from below of the negative. Okay. So remember the absolute value function. If we know that it's negative, then we take the negative of that, right? Because we know that x minus 3, the expression x minus 3, we know is going to evaluate to a negative. So then absolute value, so it's got to be positive, so we take the negative of that to make it positive. And this is over x minus 3, okay? So what's that equal to? 
Okay, so these guys, yeah, and this is, so the limit is negative 1. All right, so we stuck in the 3, we got 0 over 0. It's okay, there's a, there's a limit, it does exist. How are we going to get it? Well, so we've got to do something, right? We're going to redefine the absolute value function to be the negative of x minus 3 because we know that when x is below 3, that the result here will be a negative. So here, x is above 3. So we're going to use the same strategy, right? We'll say the limit. Okay, and remember, this doesn't, this, why did I put negative 1? From the there. Limit as x approaches 3 from above. Okay, if it's positive, how's the absolute value function defined if we know that the argument is positive? Just is what it is, right? So it would just be x minus 3 over x minus 3, which is. So now you can just say, well, that's. Whoops. These guys go away, and this is equal to 1. Right? Okay, makes sense. So what's the limit as x approaches 3 of the absolute value of x minus 3 over x minus 3? That one does not exist, right? So the one-sided limits exist. They're both 1, but this does not exist, right? Because we have a negative 1 and a 1. Okay. So another way that you can think about this is you say, well, these guys, they're pretty much the same thing, right? I mean, it's x minus 3. I know that if we're approaching 3 from below, so something less than 3, that that's always positive. So don't worry about that. That's positive, And this is the exact same number, but it's going to be negative because this is less than 3. So I'll have a positive over a negative, so it's just negative 1. And again, these two things, they're going to be the exact same number, right? The exact same. They have the exact same absolute value. And this is above 3, so this is positive anyways. This will also be positive because you're taking a number bigger than 3. You got positive over positive of the exact same numbers, and that's positive. Okay? So that's another way that you can do that or think about that. Okay, question? Sir? Example 2. 4, f of x equals. So here we have a piecewise function, right? Um, is y equals f of x continuous? It, it's kind of hard to say without actually looking at it, but just looking at it, you think it's continuous. Pro probably yes or probably no. So piecewise function, probably not. So we're going to say, <coughs> eh, no, well. And if you think it's not continuous, where might it be discontinuous? So where would the discontinuity be if there was one? So what values would we want to look at? Negative 1 and 1, right? So uh, probably not, but we want to. So uh, y equals f of x might be discontinuous. We don't know. So you say, well, you know what, we're going to have to look at this, and here are the places we're going to look. We're going to look when x equals 1, or negative 1, or negative 1 and 1, I guess. Negative 1 or 1. All right, so if we're going to do that, then we've got to figure out the limits. Right? So we want the limit as x approaches negative 1. If we're going to do that, we're going to have to look at the limit from below and the limit from above to see if they're the same or if they're different. So let's look at, I guess I better leave the function definition up there. The limit as x approaches negative 1 from below. The limit as x approaches negative 1 from below. So what's that equal to? Negative 
So yeah, negative negative one minus two. So we're just going to throw a negative one in, right? We're, where are we going to throw it? Well, we're going to put it into here, right? So it's okay. When x is negative one, so we get negative negative one, which is one minus two, which is equal to negative one. Okay. And now let's look at the limit as x approaches negative one from above. So which of these three are we looking at now? <coughs> So first, middle, first, second, or third. So I want x approaching negative 1 from above. So we've got to go into the second one, right? OK, can we put a negative 1 in here? Yeah, OK, so what is it equal to? Negative 1. The limit as x approaches of f of x. So what is the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of x? So the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of x is negative 1, right? So the left, the, the two one-sided limits are the same, and so we get negative 1. Is f of negative 1 equal to this? What's f of negative 1? Negative negative 1 minus 2, 1 minus 2, negative 1. Yeah, so then it's continuous, right? So it's continuous at x equals negative 1. Right? Left sided limit is equal to the right sided limit, is equal to the function evaluated at that value, so we are continuous. Okay, so we want to do the same thing for f of 1. Okay, so you can do that. Right? So figure out the limit. So you, you, you got to do two limits, right? So you're going to do the limit as x approaches 1 from below. I don't know why I keep putting of f of x. You're going to do the limit as x approaches 1 from above of f of x. And you're going to do the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x. Okay. Now, you got the thing in front of you, right? So you're just going to, OK. So for 1 from below, which function are we using? First, second, or third? Second one, right? Coming at 1 from below means that it's between negative 1 and 1. So we're using the uh, second one. So what do we get for that? One. And uh, limit as x approaches one from above. OK, first, second, or third? Third one. OK, so what do we get for that? You know, actually, I suppose there's equals the limit x approaches 1 from above of. So we're using the third one, x squared minus 2x equals, and now we can substitute in. So it's 1 squared minus 2 times 1, which is negative 1. So here, again, yeah, so a little more detail here is the limit as x approaches 1 from below of x, which is equal to 1. I should have done the same thing up there. After imagine substitute. Well, let's go back and fix this. Thing. So really, to be detailed, so x approaches negative one. So we're coming from below. Uh, so we're using this one, which was what x minus negative x minus two. So that's negative uh, negative one. Minus 2. And here we should have said limit. Negative from above. In that case, we were saying it was x, which was negative 1. OK, that, that'll clean that up a bit. So I'll leave that there. So what's this equal to? What are we 
say about this does not exist, right? Okay? Since the limit from below and the limit from above are not the same, then it doesn't exist. So where is y equals f of x continuous? Where is it continuous? It's continuous at negative 1. <coughs> so everywhere, except x equals 1. Okay. So it's continuous everywhere, except when x equals 1. That's where it's discontinuous, right? where the two one-sided limits are different. And it wants us to sketch the graph. So we go down here and we say, OK, what's it equal to? So it's negative x minus 2. If x is less than or equal to negative 1. And we know that at negative 1, we get this. And negative x will be a straight line going that way. And it's y equals x from negative 1 to 1. Okay. But at 1, f of 1 is not 1. So f of 1, we now go down to the third function, which is x squared minus 2x. So that's negative 1. And then uh, head up like this. Big dot there. Okay, so that's your piecewise function, right? We have three pieces. We've got when x is less than or equal to negative one. We've got between negative one and positive one, which does not include, right? And then this includes. Okay. Any questions? How do you know that the half parabola starts at negative one? Like the so last the, line, how do you draw that? Yeah. So the definition is that when x is greater than or equal to one, it's going to be x squared minus two x. So you can just throw some values in. You put a one in there, you get one minus two, which is negative one. Put a two in there, you get four minus four, which is zero. Put a 3 in there, you'll get 9 minus 6, which is 3. So you can plot a few points that way. Yeah. So at 2, it's 0. At 3, it's 3. And... Okay. You can also say, well, it's an x squared. So as we move over 1, we're going to go up 1. Go over 2, go up 4, and so on. OK. Good. <coughs> I'll sketch that. So these will be saved as a PDF on in uh, Schoology, right? Which you all signed up for, right? Where all the answers are, right? And the textbook itself. So all the files are there. You want to take your textbook home? It's, there's PDFs there. Okay? PDFs of all the answers are there. Okay. Example three, if g of x equals x squared plus 2k, if x is less than 3, and 2x plus k, if x is greater than or equal to 3, then what are the values of k that would make g of x a continuous function? So then, if g of x is continuous, what do we have to have happen? So if g of x is continuous, So the, the left sided and the right sided limit at a given point, and what might that given point be? Three, right? So so we're gonna look at it and say, well, where might it be this well? Okay, the only place is at three, because that's where the two functions are different. X squared plus two k and two x plus k squared are gonna be continuous functions. Right? There's no radicals, there's no uh, uh, there's no rationals, so there'll be nowhere that those aren't defined. So uh, if g of x is continuous, then the limit as x approaches 3 from below of g of x will be equal to the limit as x approaches 3 from above of g of x, right? Those two limits will be the same. And we know that g of x is defined, right? It's defined for any x and, and k. 
well, sorry, not any k, obviously, but it's defined for any x. So, so what are we going to do? You set them up so they're like equal to each other in yeah. combination, and then sub into x. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to start off and say, okay, that means that x squared plus k, 2k, whoops, x squared plus 2k, it's going to have to equal 2x plus k squared. And where do we want that to happen? At x equals 3, right? So we want these two guys to be equal when x is equal to 3. Okay, so we can stick a 3 in there. Okay, so they have 9 plus 2k. Oh, how on, can we solve things like this? <coughs> so, what do we want to do? Put it on one side. Put it on one side. Right. So, let's move everything over here. So, we got a positive k squared. So, we're going to get k squared minus 2k. Then what? Minus 3. What's that equal to? Does it factor? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. Wait, you say k plus 1, k minus 3. Yeah. yeah. Okay, check, right? k squared minus 3k plus 1k is minus 2k. So anytime you factor, check it. Right? Even if it's the sum or difference of cubes, just run a very quick check on it. And you know, you've seen the way I check a sum or difference of cubes, right? I kind of do the square term, then take the other one and do the square term. So, okay, I got plus 4k minus 4k. Good there. I got plus 8k, you know, minus 8. So I do it that way, right? Because you're going to have to check six products, right? But, and you're just looking that it comes out to 2. That I get this cube plus or minus this cube. Okay. If you forget how to factor difference of cubes, it's pretty easy to work it out, right? Just from saying, well, all you got to do is remember that if it's a cubed plus b cubed, the first factor is a plus b. And if it's a cubed minus b cubed, the second factor is a minus b, and then you got a square root and an a, b, you know, right? So you should be able to factor, and you're expected to be able to factor. Okay, anyways, what's k? Okay, so if k is negative 1 or k is equal to 3, this will be continuous. And if not, then it won't be. Okay, so those are the values. And that's what it asks us for, right? So what are the values of k? Uh, determine the values of k if this is a continuous function. Okay, so now we're just going to start a little bit of trig. Um, Limits, just as a start, there's no homework on trig tonight, unless you wanted to do some, but um, we're just going to do a few trig things. And, uh, you know, as Ms. Tong said, we're, we're starting to wean you away from the worksheets, right? So most of the time it won't be this, right? Like in 30 1, you just got like a ton of these, right? And then we start in 31, it's like these, just, ah, it's all the same, but it's getting to the point where there's not going to be much of the worksheet. It is going to be notes. Okay. However, they're going to be saved as PDFs and stuck up there, right? So, you know, don't worry about missing stuff. The limit. So, what is the limit as x approaches pi over 6 of the sine of pi over 6? <laughs> so, what's our first strategy in doing a limit? <coughs> Sub it in. Okay. So then that's equal to the sine. And what is the sine of pi over 6, Lazar? 
right? You want to talk? What's the sine of pi over 6? Uh, oh, do some useful talking. What's the sine of pi over 6? Well, it's 30 degrees. The sine of 30 is 1 half. Yeah, so it's a half. Okay, so remember all that trig that you thought you forgot? Well, you might have forgot. Remember all that trig? You need that. Okay, so all those exact angles, sine of pi over 6, cos, tan, secant, cosecant, cotangent. Where are they defined? Where aren't they defined? Et cetera, et cetera. Or in general, right? Because what do we know about the sine function? Is it continuous or not? Yes. Yeah, it's continuous, right? So the limit as x approaches c of the sine of x is just equal to sine c. It's a continuous function, so you can substitute any value of x into it, 0, pi over 6, 1 million pi over 6, and it'll just be what it is. So that's kind of a, this is a more general way of stating that. Just the limit as x approaches some <coughs> constant of the sine of x is just the sine of that number. Okay, so we're going to do five of these. That's number one. Number two. <coughs> the limit as x approaches pi over two of sine squared x minus cos x. Write that right? Okay, I wrote that right. <laughs> what do we know about the cosine function? It is also <coughs> continuous, so then we should just be able to substitute in here, right? If sine is continuous, then it's defined at pi over 2, and we can square that value. Right? So what's that equal to, right? It's equal to the sine of pi over 2 squared. So remember, sine squared x is the sine of x. You evaluate that and then you square it. Minus cosine of pi over 2. So sine of pi over 2 is? Cos of pi over 2 is? 0. Okay. So that's just equal to 1, right? So all we're doing, just direct substitution, we worked it out, and there it is. Three. Let's go to a new page. Uh, the limit is x approaches zero. All right, well, they're both continuous, right? So we substitute in. So it just should just be sine 0 over cos 0. Oh, one thing. In trig, it's always radians, OK? So always radians all the time. Let me go back here and just say always radians. So we talk trig, we're, we're doing any trig, it's always in radians, right? Okay, what's the sine of zero? Zero, what's the cos of zero? What's zero divided by one? Well, your mark wouldn't, but it's zero. Okay. You, you can do that. Zero divided by one. It's the other way around that you have problems, but... What's zero divided by anything, as long as anything isn't zero? Okay, except for zero, right? You can't do zero divided by zero. Four. Uh, the limit as x approaches zero. What's another way of saying sine over cos? Tan. What's another way of saying cos over sine? Cotan. Okay, well, these are both continuous, right? So we can just substitute in cos 0 over sine 0. What's cosine? Well, there are. Yeah. So it's 1 over 0, which is okay. I don't know if that's so much an equal as a, well, that does not exist. Right? Okay, so you can't divide by 0. Uh, wait, I should back up one to the bit. 
Uh, here, squeeze this in here. The limit as x approaches c of cos x Okay, so I just since they're continuous functions, it holds for both of them, right? Sine x and cos x. Sort of throw that in there. Okay, last one. <laughs> Limit as x approaches zero, sine x over x. Well, that'll be sine zero over zero, which is zero over zero, which tells us what? There is a limit, we got to do something, right? So we're going to pull out a calculator and kind of look at these values, right? We're just going to do sine x over x for small values. Okay, so what do you think it is? I don't know. Okay. Um, ooh, let's go to that. Uh, clear. <laughs> this clears fast, so I just thought I'd clear it in case it was in degree mode or something, right? Or so. So, okay, we could do this, right? We could say y equals sine x divided by x. Okay. We could hit graph, sort of see what happens. All right, something's I don't really see too much in there, right? And graphing on this is like weird. But we can look in the table. So let's actually, you know what, let's go to the table set. So we'll start the table at 0. But we'll make our delta table. So delta table is just the increments it's going to use, right? So normally it's 1. So you go into the table, you see 0, 1, 2, 3, and you see negative 1, negative 2. So let's go with like 0 0.01. So we'll go by 100. So now it's going to have 0 and then 0 0.99, 0 0.98, right? Give us a better idea as we get close to 0 if we go second function table and look at this. So we got an error there. Well, we know that because it would be 0 divided by 0. So what does it look like this limit probably is? <laughs> so here's y equals sine x on a pretty big, but we want sine x divided by x, right? So divided by x. So I think this looks a little better, right? I mean, because it's kind of neat, right? Because this is at negative 100, and that's at positive 100. And you can kind of see that, you know, hey, this thing's just sort of, you know, doodling around the y-axis. But then it's got these jumps here. And kind of looks like, so, you know, if we go to trace this, and we say, okay, so as the x values get closer to 0, my y values are getting closer to 1 from below, right, until we get to 0. Okay, and then if we come from above, and then when we get there, right, we're at undefined, right? Okay, so what can we say? The limit is 1. We're back to here. Uh, okay, so then uh, what do we do? We graph this, we looked at the table, we looked at the graph. Oh, there is. Okay. Are we just going to memorize this then if we can't use our calculator? This one you're going to know. Okay, because you need to. Because you're going to use it a lot. So, uh, look at table. Look at graph. And that leads us to the limit. So the proof is on page 303, so you can look that up there. You could also go online and look up the proof. It uses something called the squeeze theorem. Are we ever going to get a question like that on the test? Which? Oh, the, the limit of sine x over x is going to be is so common that you will know that really, really well by the end of tomorrow if you do any of the homework, because you're going to use it about 15 times. Okay? So this is one you're just going to learn. Okay? 
So there's a few that you have to kind of know. There's another one which is like y minus cos x over x. And then just the limit is the limit of sine as x approaches c is just sine c. So, but this is one you have to know. Limit as x approaches zero, sine x over x is equal to one. Okay. The proof is on page 303. It does use something called the squeeze theorem. The squeeze theorem simply says that what we're going to do is take that function and squeeze it between two other functions, one of which we know is below and one above. And as we get closer and closer to some value, we can see that, well, both the below function and the above function have the same limit, which means the one that was between them also has to have the same limit. Okay. We don't do anything formal with the squeeze theorem, but you will learn that next year along with like probably the epsilon delta if you go on. Okay, so that's where we're going to stop today. You got 45 minutes.